So I'm Simon Leach and I, I launched this podcast to share the journey of inspiring leaders who are creating a sustainable, a healthy impact on the world. And in this episode, I'm joined with Charlie Dimler, CEO and co-founder of Checkerspot, a high performance materials company using biotechnology as a conduit to bring innovative and sustainable materials to the world. Um, I think before taking the big decision of co-founding Checkerspot, uh, Charlie worked across, worked for Sodesign, one of the first leaders in industrial biotech, and before that had worked within biotechnology and human therapeutics, and then starting your career in investment banking. Now, I've known Charlie for a few years. Never forget our first meeting. Charlie likes to go deep and thorough when getting to know a collaboration partner. And uh, I've always found Charlie charming, open, and always, uh, always really transparent. Uh, Charlie lives in Oakland. Uh, there can't be too many Liverpool fans, soccer fans in Oakland. Uh, he has four kids, 10 and under, and married to Miriam for 17 years, although they've been together for 26 years, and loves skiing and out outdoors adventure, and is a volunteer with the Bay Area Mountain Rescue, where he specializes in high angle rope rescue and navigating hazardous terrain. So welcome, Charlie. Thank you, Simon. Great to be here. <laughs> I think we've got to start with that, really. I mean, um, I think you've been doing that for a number of years. I mean, how did you get into that? Uh, and um, yeah, how did that all start off for you? Um, with the mountain rescue specifically? I'm sorry, I should have said with the mountain rescue, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, how did that start out? I it was from being out in in the backcountry on a couple of trips and things going wrong <laughs> there are some accidents and recognizing that um, having the not only the knowledge but the skill to do something about that to self-rescue or to help those that um, that, that are in need um, is is pretty important um, when you're that far away from primary care and I had studied um, science as, a, as an undergrad in university and was thinking a lot about going to, to medical school. I always had this interest in healthcare and delivering healthcare and ultimately decided that um, while science and medicine um, was so interesting and, and obviously my career path has tracked with that, um, I never really scratched the itch of wanting to, to help people. And um, discovered that there was this conduit of being able to, to learn skills, develop a capability that um, involved caring for people in this way. And at the same time, to do it in an environment, the outdoors in the backcountry that I absolutely love and that had real practical utility for myself and, and those that, that I encounter when, when I'm in the wilderness. And so, yeah, it was sort of a no brainer. And then along the way, I just, I've learned so much and the, the team that I'm a part of is amazing. And just the personal relationships that have emerged and the sense of, you know, giving to the community and being engaged in that way. It's just extremely fulfilling. And it's also filled out the picture for me around um, like who I live, you know, here in the San Francisco Bay area. And it can at times be a bit of, an echo chamber and having the opportunity to engage with folks from all walks of life all over the state of California um, has just really been an awesome compliment to, to my experience here. Absolutely. That sounds great. And uh, so how skilled are you? Maybe, maybe share, have you got any seat of your pants stories to share? You know, it, it sounds very dangerous, number <laughs> one. And um, yeah, anything comes to mind in terms of, uh, challenging kind of rescue or something along those lines yeah um i think the most challenging rescues inevitably are in the alpine environment um you're dealing with um different kinds of considerations and um especially when there's snow on the ground um i've been on a few um less rescues and more recoveries following avalanches that have um, wow. just introduced a new dimension where you're, you have to go into 
um, terrain that if you were just out, let's say backcountry skiing or snowshoeing, you probably wouldn't go in those directions. And so you're, you're pressing the, the, the envelope a little bit um, because you're trying to, to find someone who, who has gone missing. And yeah, there, there've been some, you know, really challenging situations in that context. And also in way up in Northern California, um, I've been involved in some searches where um, conditions have turned really drastically, you know, things like, you know, heavy, heavy rainfall and swollen rivers and people getting stranded um, and swift water rescue is like a whole different um, domain of expertise and understanding that I'm not trained in. And so when you find yourself in an environment where you have to navigate that, um, it can be a bit unsettling. <laughs> um, and yeah, and then anytime you're, you're roped up and trying to, to navigate, um, you know, situations where there's consequence if your gear fails um, can, be, can be pretty unsettling. Well, it sounds to me like high pressure, real high pressure <laughs> kind of life or death situations. So um, how often do you dedicate the time to do that? Or is this more when you're out there with your own kind of pursuits, as it were? Or is there a certain amount of time you need to spend on this? Well, I was very heavily engaged for about a 10 year period. And, and that involved, you know, trainings, you know, pretty much every month, um, searches on a regular interval, but, but largely focused um, between the shoulder seasons and the summer. Um, the, the winter searches seem to be less, mostly I think because it, during the winter, fewer people are, are going out. Um, and as a consequence, things going wrong and getting lost. Um, so there is a little bit of a weighting towards the shoulder seasons in the summer. And um, so really active for about a 10 year period. And then about um, four or five years ago, became less active as I was starting Checker Spot and, and, and also um, be becoming a father and having young children. Um, so I've been on reserve with my team now for, for a few years, but, but had, the, had the decision to make to just walk away from it entirely and just couldn't do that um, for reasons that I can expound on. Um, but, but I intend as time becomes more available in the future and the kids get a bit older to get much more engaged again because um, I, I derive so much joy from it. And it mm. just is another element of, you know, having some purpose. No, absolutely. It's a lovely story. It really is. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, I, I'd always seen that. I knew that, but it's great to explore this a, a bit further with you actually and to understand that level of commitment and what you've really derived from it. So Thanks for, sh for sharing and taking it right back then, thinking about values and influences. You know, when you were growing up, thinking around the, the major influences that helped, you know, what were the major influences that helped shape the ideas and aspirations of a, a young Charles Dimmler? Yeah, I, probably at the top of the list was um, science. I, you know, loved, <laughs> running little silly experiments. Yeah. I loved, like I had just a curiosity for the natural world. I spent a lot of time um, outdoors, um, just getting into trouble. <laughs> um, like <laughs> doing things like playing with fire, which is a really bad idea. Um, you know, it, poking around beehives. Um, the <laughs> one story that kind of sticks in my mind was, um, learning the hard way why that's a bad idea I ended up getting stung about 18 times um, by a swarm of angry bees um, I just I was fascinated by by the world and um, just spent a lot of time poking around and then when I was in high school um, just was a bit bored by some of the, the subjects like you know English <laughs> and literature um, I, I like to read but I just I didn't it didn't have as much purpose for me as science and biology, especially. And I remember um, Mr. Kennedy, my biology teacher in the ninth grade. And um, yeah, he just, 
he was a really, really positive influence um, for me. And I, I recognized then that that was the thing that interested me most academically. And at, at that time, if you liked biology, it was sort of like, oh, well, your, your career is likely to be medicine. And when I went off to university, that was where I was uh, focused and where I thought I was headed. Um, I ended up actually majoring in history, though. I saw that. I thought it was like, um, it was almost like a pre-medical and history. And I read it and I thought, yeah. is that the history of medical or something? Or is it a complete, you know, was it history of the world? No. Yeah. So I, I went to a university that had a core curriculum and that was like in your first two years, you studied the classics. You, you had like, you know, uh, philosophy and literature, humanities and, um, you know, art humanities, music humanities, and like the intention was to really provide a well-rounded uh, education and, and to not prevent, but to, to manage, to mitigate people going too deep into a particular domain subject um, and not having that, that well-balanced education. And, and for me, that was a huge influence because it opened up my eyes to other things that I just hadn't thought about, in particular uh, history. And, and when it came time for me to declare my major, um, I thought to myself, well, I'm pre-med, like I'm taking, you know, all of these science classes and math classes, and I want to continue to have some level of balance. And history really appealed to me because it was clear that that was an area where I could continue to work on developing like critical thinking skills and writing ability and communicating ability. And I felt like when you study history, you're really taking on board a wide swath of different um, disciplines from economics to, um, you know, political science to, um, you know, writing like just a really wide swath of of things that get covered in history i mean the history of science and and so that seemed to me to be the most interesting and yeah i mean to this day most of the reading that i do outside of work is history and, and non-fiction got it so it's perfectly set you up with this love of science and biology it perfectly set you up for a career in banking, right? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, that, um, that was just a detour. That, yeah. Yeah, that it was. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So when I was uh, a senior, um, I I knew that I was having doubts about not science and medicine, but about practicing medicine. So I'd had a mentor in when I was in university. I was doing bench research, um, actually studying neurotrauma at um, a medical center in New York City and really looked up to the, the gentleman who ran the lab. And at that time, he was leaving his practice and he was doing that to go and start a business. And that like just got my attention and was intriguing. And, and he was leaving medicine as he described it because of all of the bureaucracy associated with the practice of medicine here in the United States. And, you know, at that time managed care was a big thing, like physicians feeling as though they really weren't empowered to make clinical decisions was a consideration. My grandfather who was a pediatrician was also retiring and leaving medicine and saying some of the same things. And I had an uncle who was an orthopedic surgeon and was frustrated with practicing okay. medicine. And that, scared me i was like yeah and, and especially yeah. when you think of how much it costs and how long the training is at that time i thought you know wow i could become yeah i could go through this process and be you know old at 30 or 35 years old and decide that i wanted to go and switch careers and that alarmed me and so i ended up not committing to it and i thought i'm just going to take a year or two or three to reflect on this and then decide whether to apply and there was a, a fork in the road, road and I was either going to go to Wall Street and spend some time uh, in investment banking, or I considered going to the Marine Corps and becoming a, going to officer candidate school, being an officer in the Marines. And um, yeah, it's a longer story, but I ended up deciding to go to Wall Street. No, oh, got it. Um, that's interesting. Tell me just, what, what did your parents do uh, career-wise? 
My father was um, in business. Um, he worked for many, many years, uh, the American Can Company, um, which was in the aluminum business. And then he, um, when I was a kid, sort of pivoted, um, spent some time getting a graduate degree and then got into investing and um, worked for a London-based bank that you may know, Hambro's Bank. Yeah, for sure, um, yeah. Yeah, um, so he was um, a banker investor for, okay. for most of my childhood. Um, and my, my mother was a stay at home mom. She was a homemaker. I got it. I got it. And, and tell me, so, so after the banking, I know you went to work for, am I pronouncing you right? Geron. That's right. Geron. Geron. So I know you worked there for, uh, for eight years or, or, or so. How, how much did working there in those eight years prepare you for working at Sovazine? Um, I, I mean, in a, in a huge way that I would categorize number one through the science. So, you know, Geron was focused on innovating, uh, primarily two technology platforms, um, looking at telomere biology, telomeres being responsible for aging. And there's a overexpression of a protein called telomerase that, um, is characteristic of tumor cells cancer. And so um, Geron had developed an oncology therapeutic that was a telomerase inhibitor. Um, and then Geron was also innovating um, or pioneering embryonic stem cells. So leveraging embryonic stem cells to get therapeutic cell types like, you know, neurons for, you know, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and uh, spinal cord injury through to, you know, uh, pancreatic islet cells for diabetes or osteoblite, osteoblasts or chondrocytes for orthopedic applications. And so a lot of um, cell biology and a lot of molecular biology and just, um, you know, diving deep into those areas was, was definitely foundational for what would come at Solozyme from, mm. uh, from a technology development perspective. But, but arguably more important because my role was in corporate development, I was not in the lab, um, was the exposure to um, strategy, to finance, to capital raising um, within a company as contrasted with being an investment banker. Um, and advising and being a service provider to companies. And I had just a phenomenal mentor with uh, a gentleman by the name of David Greenwood, um, who was the CFO and uh, EVP of corporate development at Geron, who had been you know, a 20 plus year banker prior to joining Geron. And so we kind of spoke the same language and it was a, a pretty seamless transition for me. Um, but But the exposure to you know, thinking about transactions and uh, deals as a way <clears throat> to build value in a company, as a way to help accelerate commercial development, mm. um, as a way to complement um, technology development. Um, yeah, it just, it was amazing training and, and absolutely experiences that I could speak specifically to from Geron applied to things that I ended up leading at Solozyme. Yeah, great. What was the attraction at the time? Because you're working for a biotech firm that developing innovation and no doubt having an impact with the technology out there and human health. What was the attraction at that time though to move across to more of an industrial kind of setting um, using biotech for more of that, so that type of application? Well, the thing that Geron and Solozyme had in common that was important for me was impact, was doing something that I perceived as being virtuous that would you know, help people's quality of life or help the world in some way. That, that's always been something important to me, even going back to you know, high school and, and university. Um, the difference being that at, at Geron, you know, I, I had been there for eight years and just before I decided to leave, we filed um, with the FDA, um, the first uh, IND, Investigational New Drug Application for 
the world's first human embryonic stem cell therapeutic, which was um, an oligodendrocyte for spinal cord injury. And there was this point in time that I thought, okay, we just filed the IND. And if the wind is at our backs, if the stars align, if everything goes according to plan, we might have a product on the market in another seven or eight years. And, and that, that's a long time. Um, and I just, you know, at this point in my life, I was, you know, in my, you know, early thirties and I just felt like I wanted to do something faster. Um, and, and I, I also had this responsibility at that time at Geron where I was the, the general manager for the company's subsidiary in the UK um, up in Edinburgh. And I was commuting between Menlo Park, California and, and Edinburgh. And I'd been doing that for a few years and, you know, it's very taxing. It's, that's a big trip to do every couple of weeks. Um, and so was, that was like enough of a catalyst to say, could I deploy, you know, my skill set and do something that I think has similar impact, but where there was closer proximity to product and mm. commercialization, which is where, where I was most interested in. And <clears throat> just coincidentally had been introduced to the founders of Solazyme at the same time. And it was like, I was sold quickly. Um, I, it just really, um, it really ticked the box of, okay, if this works, we're going to have a product on the market a lot sooner. And it, it actually act, totally played out that way. Um, and, and then the opportunity to, come in and not only um, lead, but build the corporate development function at Solazon was um, <laughs> appealing, although scary. And, and the first order of business at Solazon was to raise the Series C financing. And so I remember very distinctly sitting down with my wife and having the conversation, you know, there's a really good thing we have going at Geron. <laughs> you know, does it make sense to pick up and join something that is a lot riskier um, that, you know, like worst case scenario, I'm back looking for a job um, quickly. And yeah, she, uh, she was really supportive of it. And she understood why I was even asking the question and it ended up not being a very long conversation. And I made the move. Great. Great. And, and how do you, you know, when you reflect on that time, eight years, a long time, uh, you know, it was, it was a fascinating time you know, for that business. So when you, when you look back, um, how do you reflect on that time? And what do you think you've really learned or took from that experience that stood you in good stead in your you know, setting up Checker Spot as co-founder and CEO? With Geron specifically? or with No, no, Solazine? with Solazheim. Solazheim. With Solazheim. Yeah, I mean, it, Solazheim was, when I joined, um, about 20 people on the team. So uh, it was founded in 2003 and I joined, I made the commitment to join right at the end of 2007 and officially joined in 2008. And um, so it was still a startup. Um, and, and I described a moment ago, the, the risk profile and, and even, you know, after the series C, like then raising the series D and then ultimately the IPO and then some subsequent financings, there was always um, risk and, and learning, you know, how to manage those risks and thinking about that strategically was uh, a huge influence. Um, you know, understanding, <laughs> we used to joke, we still joke, um, that being at a startup is a little bit like building the plane while flying it. <laughs> and um, there, there's a lot of um, balls in the air. You know, you have individuals that are wearing multiple hats you have, you know, cultural considerations, um, tensions that exist. For instance, you know, you get to a, a point where you know you need to, to grow. You know you need to bring in capabilities of, let's say, individuals that have worked at large companies that know supply chains. But, but when they make that transition into the startup environment where everybody's building the plane while flying it and there isn't the infrastructure that they're used to, that can be quite jarring for individuals. 
and, and just being exposed to all of the different facets of rapid growth, you know, tackling uncertainty, um, you know, considering and, and, and developing ways to manage risk, um, you know, engaging with a wide variety of personality types um, and, and then engaging in, in, in doing transactions, you know, both with investors as well as with strategics. And um, yeah, I mean, SolarSign really provided another opportunity to engage in international business and this time in a very different geography than where I had focused most of my time at Geron, which was in Western Europe and in Asia. And now I was spending a lot of time in South America in addition to Western Europe and Asia. And it, yeah, definitely um, was a great place to to be in the crucible, to be mm-hmm. outside my comfort zone, to um, face a lot of uncertainty and difficulty and, and figure a way through. Sounds like the perfect uh, learning ground to, uh, to stand you in great stead uh, for, for setting up Checkerspot. And, uh, you know, it's interesting when you mentioned about that discussion you had with your wife at the time and uh, you know, you're leaving, you know, Geron, you're taking on more risk, you're assessing the risk and taking more risk at a company like Solozyme. Would have been interesting coming back after the Solozyme when you were having that discussion about setting up Checkerspot and uh, Mm -hmm. around the risk profile there. And I would have thought at that time, so back in 2016, I don't know how old your kids were or how many you had, I think you would have had Probably two. Two, yeah. You would have had two. two. So that must have been a really different conversation. And I, I, I always, yeah, how, how, when you were looking at risk profiles, how were you able to take on that profile of setting up kind of checker spot at that time? Um, um, <laughs> that's such a good question. I mean, I, I had a sense... I've, I've always had a sense that at some point in time, I, I probably would be starting a company and, and not because that, you know, had been or is on like a bucket list or something that's important to me. It was just something intuitively that I thought was probably going to happen. And, and it also factored in to, you know, the decision to go to soul design, because at that time in that conversation with my wife, it was like, even if this goes badly, even if this fails famously, it will be a great experience. I will learn a lot. And, and that, that was another important consideration, but, but fast forward to, you know, 2014, 2015, um, the strategic direction of soul design started to shift. And, and ultimately, Solozyme renamed itself Terravia and was focused on food and nutrition opportunities. And as I mentioned before, for me, there was so much about impact and so much about um, the science that was important to me. I didn't join Solozyme because of the, the, an interest in food and nutrition opportunities. And, and so that, that was one of a few catalysts that made me pause and start to think about things. And, and what we're doing at Checkerspot is decidedly built on the shoulders of the Solzheim experience. Um, and, and Scott, my co-founder, who led molecular biology and discovery at Solzheim, was similarly thinking about, yeah, there's like a whole area of this amazing technology platform that is just sort of being ignored. And, and so we, we kind of came together and said, like, maybe there, there's a different way to do things here. Maybe there's an other path. And, and you're right, you know, now I was, I was older, I was in my early 40s. And, you know, we had two children and, you know, another one on the way. And w- my wife and I had the conversation around risk. And, um, but she she ended up finding this um, this little it's like a postcard um, and it's a quote from Martin Luther King um, that basically says you know faith is taking the first step without knowing where the staircase leads 
And um, yeah, she left that postcard one morning. I was about to leave for a, a long trip. And, you know, it was one of those, you know, you're getting up before the rest of the house and, you know, turn on the lights to make a quick cup of coffee. And it was sitting there and it was like her way to say, you know, yeah, like take the leap. Um, this is, this is important to you. And, um, yeah, so it was a scary point in time when I made the decision, I made the decision to leave Souls on in the summer of 2015. <clears throat> but I wanted to see through one last transaction and I felt a sense of commitment to the team at Solozyme. And so I sat down with um, my, 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 my supervisor, the CEO of the company and explained that it was time for me to move on, but that I would see through this last transaction and then, and then move on. And I thought that it would take about three or four months to close that transaction and ended up being a year. And, but then at the end of that, I, I made the leap and I moved on and yeah, it was stepping into the unknown. Um, and yeah, I think the thing that scared me more than the possibility of failure was um, at some point in time, looking back and saying that um, I didn't do it because I was too scared. That scared me more. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's a wonderful quote. And uh, <laughs> well, clearly it's a joint, all these things are, are family decisions, right? It's really important that everyone's on board and, uh, and make the decision together. But uh, yeah, I always remember us talking about, you know, the early days and around that sense of sacrifice from everyone that's on the mission, actually. And, uh, yep. you know, that's why it's so great to see you guys move forward. And why, you know, I'm always interested in charting your path and, seeing you succeed because you know, people have really sacrificed, you know, to, to join the journey as it were. And uh, I think that's great. It, and that means so much like, yeah. I mean, everybody, I mean, you, I know you completely understand this. Everybody at the company has made a sacrifice and to be at a moment in time where you're locking arms and doing that together it's it's pretty special and yeah i feel i feel fortunate to to be part of it and um it's more of a like a responsibility and to to lead it than um and, and to serve the team as opposed to pulling the team mm, absolutely so tell me just uh, let's touch upon the mission you know the checker spot mission yeah. i'm thinking more about the impact that you're having on the world right now and then the impact you're going to have on the world. The mission of the company is to expand the palette of molecular building blocks um, to create performance materials that also have the added benefit of being more sustainable relative to, let's say, petroleum-based feedstocks and monomers. Um, and yeah, like if you look at the history of um, product development, it's it's a history that's characterized by utilizing what's been available at big scale at, at commodity scale and at low cost. And, you know, we know that we can leverage, we can utilize biotechnology to create totally new monomers that then translate to better performing products. And we can do this through biomanufacturing, which means big scale and at a competitive cost structure. And, and so the mission is, to realize that vision, um, to, to bring to the world a new way of thinking about sourcing performance building blocks to get to better materials and ingredients. Excellent. Excellent. And tell me a little bit about some of the, the, the functionality of the new materials that we'll be using in the future that we're not using now. Well, today we're commercializing three materials. Um, one is a textile finish that um, is used in wicking. So it's applied to, um, in particular, synthetic fabrics and it is hydrophilic. So it pulls moisture away from the skin. So think like a base layer for aerobic activity. Um, the second is a urethane based composite that uh, we engineered for light weighting, strength to weight. Um, and then we also were targeting damping properties, energy absorbing properties. Um, and we initially brought that to market um, in a ski, ski construction, 
um, and it replaces the core of the ski. And then third, we've more recently, most recently, introduced uh, a urethane cast that um, is a poured urethane to replace um, ABS plastic. ABS plastic, think um, like Legos are ABS plastic. Mm. Um, and typically ABS plastic is in the sidewall of the ski. It's the visible part right at the edge of the ski above the metal edges. And we have a poured urethane that similar to the, the core composite, this poured urethane is engineered for strength to weight and damping, but it has an added benefit, which is that it's poured. And so you don't have to mill it. You don't have to um, generate waste. It's a zero waste way of, of manufacturing, which is really, really interesting and cool. Um, so those are the three things that we have on the market today. And, and yeah, like core to the, the checker spot platform is innovating new kinds of, of oils. And so when you think about how vast this can be, you just need to consider how carbon <laughs> is the backbone of the world's industrial economy. Carbon is the backbone. So petroleum, commodity vegetable oils like palm oil, soy, mm. sunflower. Anything where oil is used is within the zip code of what our technology platform could address. But, but to be clear, we're, our strategy is not to go and replace low value product applications initially. Our strategy is to find ways to create better products, performance products, where we're, we're improving the, the performance profile for the consumer. Um, and then over time, we, we do intend to get into some of those more commodity-based markets with greater scale. And that's, that's important because that's where we really see and where we get excited about the impact that this can have for the planet and for things like climate change, but also for, for human health. There are applications of, of oils and triglycerides that have utility in nutrition, as an example. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, ah, very exciting, and the future is uh, the future is bright. And the key thing here is the feedstock, as you've said, it's it's non-carbon. It's all through sustainable kind of biotechnology, um, you know, renewable materials. Essentially, that's, that's right. the key component and context of the business. Essentially, that that's right. And, and, you know, sustainability is top of mind for so many of us, especially in a world that is on fire with the global pandemic, like science matters. <laughs> like 2020 has amplified the degree to which science matters in, in my opinion. And, and so when you think about products that are more sustainable, historically speaking, quite often people associate that with a deterioration in performance. Like, yeah, it's sustainable. I can feel good about it, but it's not going to work as good as, you know, this other thing that I've got. And, and that is a false compromise. It's a false debate. Um, and what we know to be true is that we can create better things relative to petroleum but we can do that in a more sustainable way. And that's what we're trying to bring to life through our initial product offerings. And that's the future of not only what we're doing at Checker Spot, but within the biomanufacturing space more broadly. It's like a win-win, essentially. Better performance yeah. and, uh, and yeah. healthier, essentially. That's right. That's right. No, great. Um, tell me, when you're... Um, you know, clearly you're very, you know, values focused. Um, we've spoken about that a lot during this discussion. Tell me when you're, when you're building the team, um, how do you, you know, what are the key values um, that the checker spot team live by, for instance? And when you're building the team, how do you then best maintain those values? Well, it goes back to even before Scott and I founding the company. Um, you know, for starters, um, Scott, myself, and a few others on the team um, worked together at Solozyme. And so we had the benefit of, you know, more than a decade worth of um, not hearing what someone's values are, 
but experiencing their values. How do they show up? How do they contribute? You know, what happens when, you know, <laughs> when you're taking fire, when you're diving into the foxhole, like how are people behaving? Like that's when you really learn about folks. Um, and, and before we <laughs> submitted the articles of incorporation and set up Checker Spot, Scott and I took time and wrote out, um, we actually went through this exercise of like, Scott went away, I went away, and we wrote just prose about what kind of company we wanted to build and what would the values that the company look like. And we came back with, you know, pages and pages and pages of stuff. We shared it, we exchanged it, and then we distilled it down to what we referred to as the operating principles. And there are 10 operating principles that um, we landed on. And, and then we incorporated Checker Spot. And those operating principles we've carried with us. And it's not something that you will ever see in Checker Spot's lobby. It's not something that, you know, we put up on the website. And, and even, you know, in job descriptions, mm. you know, people will say, oh, like you should put, you know, what's the culture like at the company? And, and what we've written on job descriptions is, you know, we're not going to write about our culture or our values in a job description. You have to come and get to know us and experience it to really appreciate it. Um, and the way that um, we, we honor those, um, you know, we find ourselves from time to time, you know, faced with decisions where we'll invoke the operating principles. Um, I'll give one example, which is, trust um, you know they're having having an organization that is characterized by high trust is both in my opinion exceedingly important and exceedingly difficult to to reinforce to maintain it's so easy especially with people moving quickly where there's little gaps and voids of information there's a natural human tendency to make assumptions when there's a void of information. And it takes, it takes a different way of thinking things to say, you know what, I'm gonna suspend judgment and I'm gonna trust that this decision was made for the right reasons, or I'm gonna trust that in the capability of this individual. And when that, that is happening in practice, it's, it's a pretty special thing, but it takes work, it takes effort. And, and yeah, we do find ourselves referring back to our operating principles at times, just ourselves, um, and we take it really seriously. That's great, and uh, I think um, just experiencing and spending time with you and the team—it's yeah, it's a special bond and connection there. And I know a lot of people have worked together before, but it seems such an open culture. It seems that no one's afraid of what they say and. There's just a willingness to be able to kind of share freely. That's probably the thing. There was an ease that I yeah. picked up on, which I think really comes across, I think, you know, the, one of the first things I saw. Yeah, and, and, and that's something that I, I feel in particular, um, like conflict is, is a great example where um, a lot of times, you know, organizations will try to avoid conflict and sweep it under the rug and, you know, focus on, you know, conflict <laughs> resolution and, and, and actually like we, we've tried to instill a, a different way of thinking about something like that, which is, yeah, create a space where people have the comfort and the confidence to express a point of view that might not be widely held or that they know is going to meet some level of resistance. Um, but it's, it's at those points of friction it's at those points of discomfort that I think you find where the magic happens, where exceptional teams emerge. I think, you know, th th it's fiction to believe that if everybody in the room agrees, if everything is going, you know, perfectly, that that's where extraordinary value is created. I just, mm. I, I haven't seen that in my career. And I think coming back to the root of your question around values, if you have shared values and if you have a lexicon and a way to navigate that friction, that tension, and to do it in a constructive, positive way, great things happen. And, and, and Simon, 
I will be the first to admit that we don't have this dialed at Checker Spot. These core operating principles, these values are things that we're aspiring towards. But, but I do have a level of optimism and a bit of pride that we're, we're on the right track. And I think that that's reflected in, in what we've been able to accomplish in you know, the four years since we founded. Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks for sharing. And um, listen, Charlie, that's, that's been brilliant. I've really enjoyed this uh, conversation. Just, just wanted to say a massive congratulations to you and Checker Spot on your recent uh, Series B raise. Uh, I, I know you closed a, a few months ago and uh, like wishing you all the best, you know, on this next stage of journey. And uh, it's been delightful, uh, you know, sharing and discussing your journey with you. So thank you very much. Likewise, Simon. Enjoyed the conversation and yeah, look forward to speaking again.